When I was a kid, I was always fascinated by the idea of thermal vision, like heat vision, like the Predator had. The idea that we are giving off light that the naked eye just cannot see. That you can build something though that can detect that light and you can see it. I remember when I was maybe 10 or 11, I read about a technology that the military were using that could see poison gas clouds being deployed across the battlefield. The thermal vision, I could always get my head around. The body is giving off some heat, the environment around it isn't giving off the same amount of heat, so you can kind of see the difference. I can kind of believe that as a kid. Unfortunately, and it's been debunked, detecting this sort of gas doesn't work because there isn't enough thermal energy, there isn't enough heat to actually tell the difference between the environment. How do you see an invisible gas? That's exactly what one of my friends, Dr. Zhao Ai, is trying to do in his startup QLM. Hey Ben, long time no see. Long time no see, exactly. How are you doing? Good. Like you lost a unicorn. Zhao is one of those guys that's probably one of the smartest people that you've ever met if you do get the opportunity to meet him. Uh, he's reasonably quiet, but he sits there and just knows things. That's kind of his role. That's what I do. I drink and I know things. He's using quantum mechanics to search for natural gas, for methane, for CO2, all these invisible gases that are at the moment leaking out of landfills, leaking out of oil and gas pipelines, leaking out of factories so that these leaks can be stopped because all these gases are damaging to the environment. They're all considered greenhouse gases. Now, this is a topic I touched on before in this video here, but I wanted to go into a bit more of the technical detail. Like, how does it actually work? Let's hear from the inventor himself first, so you can hear it, how he explains it. Then I'll do a little bit of a summary. Yeah, it's very easy to understand our product. We, we Effectively, what we're bringing is the technology of LIDAR. We combine LIDAR technologies with spectroscopy when you send a laser light, like a normal light that does, we measure the distance, but we also measure the spectrum. And we also use a spectrum that targets for gas absorption. So you're uniquely targeting for that gas per camera. So we have a CO2 camera, we have a methane camera, we have other gas camera. Did you catch that? He says something really interesting. We combine LiDAR technologies with spectroscopy LiDAR stands for, no one really knows, uh, light detecting and ranging, horrible name. Basically the idea is you shoot a laser beam at something, you wait and you listen until the laser beam returns to you because you know the speed of light is approximately constant. Uh, you can work out how far away the object is. It's how a lot of autonomous vehicles, autonomous cars navigate. They measure things around them by shooting a laser beam at it millions of times a second uh, so that they can avoid obstacles. This tells you that although Zhao will be looking for an invisible cloud of gas, he will always need something solid behind that gas to bounce the laser off of like the ground, like maybe a building, maybe a human being, whatever. And the way you capture that return event of that laser beam bouncing back to you is on something called a single photon detector. A single photon detector detects a single particle of light. It's a bit like Geiger counter, which everyone familiar with, but for photons. It's essentially a single pixel that catches light one photon at a time with really high time precision, like down to the picosecond, depending on the type of uh, single photon detector that you get. So you have really granular resolution of when your laser beam went out and when your laser beam returned to you. He also said spectroscopy. This is, to me, the interesting bit. And the, the difficult thing is this is uh, obviously a sort of click. Boom, boom, boom. You got photons, you don't have photons. How do you build an actual spectral measurement with this uh, non-classic type of detectors? To do a spectroscopy measurement, you need a spectrum of light. You shoot this full spectrum of light at a target material and certain parts of that spectrum, as they bounce back to you, won't come back because they'll get absorbed into the vibrations of the gas molecules. If you want to find out a little bit more, that's called absorption spectroscopy, if you did want to go away and kind of Google that term. Or if you do understand that idea, put a better description than what I have just provided in the comments. However, that to me is not quite the interesting part that we're getting there. What I want you to scratch your head about is how you do this with a laser beam. When you use a laser, a laser is typically very narrowly confined as a single wavelength, not a spectrum of light, because they're made from a resonant cavity uh, where the size and the material that is inside that cavity only really amplifies a very narrow waveband, only one color of light. The other bit of the head scratcher is when you're detecting, 
what we said is you're using a single photon detector. It's really, really accurate. It can detect second by second, boom, 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 the light as it arrives on it, but it's totally ignorant as to the color of that light. So unlike the camera in your cell phone, maybe, uh, that can detect and, and resolve colored images because each pixel is actually made up of three pixels, a red, a green, and a blue pixel. Uh, with a little filter on top and only red light gets through one, only blue light gets through another, only green light gets through the third one. And from that, you can back solve and work out what color actually the object you were looking at was. You can't do that with a single photon detector. A single photon detector is exactly one, one pixel, not broken up to be able to detect different wavelengths, different colors. Now, Zhao didn't tell me the answer to this in the interview, and I thought it was kind of impolite to ask. Uh, I'm also gonna redact a couple of the details that I think might be sensitive, but I'm gonna give my approximation of how Zhao probably achieves this. First part of the answer is be as smart as Zhao uh, and take a reasonably known but annoying feature of lasers called Chirp, which isn't a Twitter knockoff. It's an artifact of making very fast pulsed laser systems, ones that you're kind of turning on and off really quickly. So pulse laser, pulse laser, pulse laser, pulse laser. It turns out that the start of that laser pulse, the beginning of the laser pulse, will be a slightly different color to the end of the pulse as the laser system comes and kind of stabilizes. That becomes your spectrum. But that's all well and good. You've got a spectrum, but we said again that the single photon detector doesn't really care about spectrum. It just cares about how much light is arriving photon by photon at any given point in time. So how do we get color information out? Let me say it first how I guess uh, I would as a scientist, then I'll explain it. I would usually say to a fellow colleague that we have mapped the frequency spectrum onto the time domain. What a ludic ludicrous thing to say, uh, but that's exactly how a scientist would communicate it to another scientist. What that actually means is that on my laser pulse, I know that there are different frequencies because at the start of my laser, my laser is one color, at the end of my laser pulse, my laser is a slightly, slightly different color. But because these frequencies definitely occur at different points in time, it means that on the return signal, coming back to my detector, I know that the frequency information will also be time delayed. So I know that on my detector, if I can break it down picosecond by picosecond uh, as to how much light is arriving, I am essentially resolving that frequency by frequency information arriving back at my detector. What I would need to do if I was Zhao was make sure that the sweep of that spectra covers the characteristic absorption peak of the gas that I'm looking for. Then if I shine my laser through a gas cloud, I should get a drop in intensity in the middle, roughly, of that pulse duration. I take a bunch of these measurements really quickly, scanning my laser beam around a scene, and I can take into account things like the weather, things like the wind, and I can back solve so that I have seen my invisible gas cloud. And we are one step closer to better tackling gas leaks that lead to climate change. Pretty cool. If you'd like to hear the interview that I did with Zhao, I'll leave a link in the description. But until that point, see you next time.